Okay, so um, this is on uh, social engineering response, uh, the psychopathic profile. So um, before we begin, uh, a note about uh, profiling and uh, psychological instruments. Uh, so uh, to evaluate people for psychopathy, this really should be left up to professionals. Uh, I'm not trying to say that arrogantly, it's just, it's just that it is. Um, I'm actually not qualified to do it, but, um, and the reason being is that uh, we're going to touch on the psychopathic profile. Oh, yeah, okay. Uh, we're going to touch on the, the psychopathic profile. And uh, psychopathy uh, can mask itself. They, they can be, if you see yourself um, or if you, you uh, feel like somebody you know uh, fits this, really you want to talk to a mental health professional. Um, and the real reason being is that uh, it may be nothing. Um, there are traits uh, for other disorders that mask psychopathy that look like it. Or um, unfortunately, you, you could actually know a psychopath. Uh, not jokingly, in all seriousness, um, these people are actually uh, master manipulators, and, and they can be quite dangerous. Uh, so, I mean, you, you could be in a potentially very bad situation. Um, <clears throat> so, um, a quick question. Um, if you saw a photograph, uh, something like a crime scene where someone's head was blown off, uh, what would be your first reaction? Uh, and uh, so, you know, would it be disgust? Would it be horror? Uh, possibly intrigue. So, um, just keep that in mind. We'll revisit that later. So, uh, <clears throat> quick quote, he will choose you, disarm you with his words, and control you with his presence. Uh, he will delight you with his wit and plans. He will show you a good time, but you will always get the bill. He will smile and deceive you, and he will scare you with his eyes. And when he is through with you, and he will be through with you, he will desert with you, he will desert you and take you, eh, take with him your innocence and your pride. You'll be left with much sadder, but not a lot wiser. And for a long time, you will wonder what happened and what you did wrong. And if another of his kind comes knocking at your door, will you open it? Uh, so this is a quote from a, a psychopath to a psychologist by the name of Robert Hare. Uh, he actually created what they call the psychopathic checklist. Um, he's kind of the father of the industry for kidding and diagnosing psychopaths. Uh, so... <clears throat> um, when I, when I say I'm going to have a talk about psychopathy in a security conference, everybody looks at me and they're like, why are you giving a talk on that? Uh, and it's a really good question. Um, and in truth, uh, why we care is uh, because when it comes to breaking the rules and deceptions, um, these people are the, uh, they're the professionals. Uh, they're always very charming, and they can be very scary, too. They're, they're master manipulators. Uh, they are ruthless in pursuit of their goals. Like when they want something, they will stop at nothing to get it. Uh, the rest of us are pawns in their chess games. And, and hurting you, it, it doesn't matter to them. Um, <clears throat> and quite honestly, like if you want to talk about their predator-prey relationship, they're actually experts at picking out people they can deceive and manipulate. Um, it's not like them picking the wrong person. They'll, they'll eventually find the right one and get it. It might be you, it might not. Um, but they're, they're the experts at it. Um, <clears throat> In truth, uh, the thing that makes them really scary is that they actually have a biological advantage over the rest of us. Um, if you look at psychopaths and where they come from, they come from all societies, they come from all races, they come from all socioeconomic, socioeconomic backgrounds. We can't say that psychopaths are actually people that, oh, well, if you had parented them differently or if they had not grown up in the hood or whatever, they would be different. They're always going to be that way. They don't change. They are predisposed to being who they are. Uh, and so there is absolutely no way for us to look at it and say, like, well, we keep the bad people out because quite possibly when it's one of them, they could be sitting right next to you. Um, <clears throat> compared to them, we, we really are amateurs. And, and the real reason is the deception is, is actually against our nature. If you think about it evolutionarily, um, you know, we, were, we, we evolved to cooperate. That's how we survived as society. It's part of the thing that makes us different from other animals. Um, the other thing, too, is that when we grow up, uh, we're taught to get along with people. We're taught to work in groups. Uh, they don't believe that. Um, and uh, this conditions in us a, a kind of a, a fear of getting caught, uh, you know, kind of that flight or fright response. We have the possibility of, of something going wrong. We get scared, and that triggers us off. Uh, I had a... a I knew a clinical psychologist who who then was a professor, but he, uh, as an example, he said, he said most people get this whole drug stealing thing wrong, and he said everybody thinks that people steal so that they can do drugs. And he says no, it's not true. He says really what it is is they do drugs to calm them down themselves down to steal. the The whole idea being is that. Uh, you know, how do you, you know, what's the easiest way to get out of a building? You, you walk out the front door and you act like you're there. Them taking drugs allows them to do that. Psychopaths don't have that problem. So, uh, psychopaths, uh, the scary thing about it is that they're actually highly narcissistic. Um, they they want to be on top. And they are highly impulsive. 
and they will take big risks to get what they want. Uh, Robert Hare announced, he said, you're, you're far more likely to find a psychopath in a boardroom than you are in a janitor's closet. They want to be on top. They want to be in control. Uh, psychologist Kevin Dutton from Cambridge University did a study of the population in England. He sent out a, a survey, and uh, they kind of rated themselves. There's a, a self-questionnaire of, of how far you're in a psychopath. And he found that people like CEOs, religious leaders, heads of states, these are jobs that attract psychopaths. Like, you are far more likely to find it in, in these jobs than anywhere else. Um, and uh, <clears throat> so, for example, uh, there's a guy named Al Dunlap. Oh, I love this quote, by the way. Um, and you should, you should check on him, but I love this quote because essentially, like, every job that I've been in talks about the who moved my cheese. I uh, says, but when I met Al Dunlop, that would be Chainsaw Al Dunlop, former CEO of Sunbeam, of Sunbeam, a notorious downsaver, he effortly turns the psychopath checklist into who moved my cheese. Many items on the checklist he redefines into a manual of how to do well in capitalism. Um, so if you think about this, you're going to see the checklist of ruthless behavior, um, charmingness, uh, it, a whole things that are actually quite frightening. He says are the things that you want to get ahead, and this is why this is why uh, you know they want to be CEOs. It, it falls naturally into them. To them, hurting you is not their fault. And if you listen to them over and over again, they actually say this. Like they're almost like they're well, they are abusers, but they say this. If you're talking, it's like, well, why did they? You know, why did you con this person? Why did you commit? You know, mortgage fraud? Why did you beat her? And it's like, well, you know, they they deserved it. They let me do it. I was teaching them a lesson, or you know, they were having a good time. It just, you know, I I, I took the money as as an exchange. It's not their fault. To them, they really don't think so. Um, more importantly, uh, the thing that's kind of scary is that society actually rewards their behavior. It's not something like, uh, I, I don't want to say, I want pedophilia, where, you know, it's like if you do something to a kid, society gets angry at you. Um, for them, society actually says, no, you're, you're actually doing a good job uh, for the most part. Um, a lot of people think the antiheroes are cool. I mean, I'm not saying that, uh, you know, I've looked at Jack Bauer, anybody's looked at Jack Bauer and called him a psychopath, but how many people think that Jack Bauer torturing the bad guy is okay? I mean, if you listen to American society and they, they go on, it's like, well, how should we, you know, how should we handle the terrorists? Turn Jack Bauer on him. Obviously, he like, exactly, you know, he, he stomps over people's rights. Like, we don't care as long as he's on our side. Um, and quite honestly, the thing that's a little sad is that having them on your side actually is advantage from time to time. I personally, I want a lawyer who wins. <laughs> like, lawyer's a really nice guy. That's nice. I don't care. Um, <laughs> and, and really, like, if you have a, a surgeon who happens to be psychopathic, uh, it, they, they're very cool under pressure. They're very calm. I don't want somebody, like, cutting my heart open by accident because he got a case of nerves. Um, but to them, uh, in truth, the ends really do justify the means. Uh, and as a society, we allow that. If you think of, like, how many people have a 401k here? Raise your hands. 401k? Yeah. We want it to make money, right? So, you know, if we invest in a company or if, if our people invest in a company and they hire a psychopath as a CEO to downsize, uh, then, you know, for us, on the outside, that looks good. Um, another quote from Ronson actually about Al Dunlopping, it says, and I realized what a godsend to a corporation a man who enjoys firing people must be. Um, he, went into, he, he went into Sunbeam to boost stocks and he, like, he, he fired, uh, you know, company or he fired... Uh, he fired entire people in towns uh, for being in factories and stuff to, to boost it. And to everybody else on the outside, they're like, wow, Sunbeam stock is really going up. But, you know, they didn't understand. It's like what he's really doing is destroying towns. He's ruining people's lives for their stock. But that's what they paid him to do. Now, here's the thing that's actually really scary about it is that um, if a psychopath were like one in a million, one in 10,000, maybe one in a thousand, it really wouldn't be that big of a deal. It'd be like, oh, yeah, well, there are these people here. But, you know, to us, it, it really doesn't... Um, you know, it, we, we don't encounter them that much. In truth, psychopaths are actually about 1% of the society. Maybe, maybe a little, yeah, little bit less in, in U.S. society. Maybe, 100, maybe 150 on the outside. Um, so here's an example. Um, there are 313 million people in the United States. Now, uh, I was a child of the 80s. I clearly, clearly remember, like, everywhere I went, you know, AIDS is bad. Um, you know, make sure that, you know, you're, you're being protective. Don't, you know, watch out for heinous drug use or whatever. They talk about catching HIV, and, and HIV is a heinous disease. I'm not making fun of it. Um, currently, there are about 1.1 million people with HIV in the United States. So if you look at it, statistically uh, speaking, you are three times more likely to sleep with a psychopath than you are to sleep, you are to sleep, to sleep with someone with HIV. You let that sink in for a moment about how many there actually are. Um, in truth, everybody in this room has probably met one along the way. We just didn't realize it. They could be your boss, your coworker, your friend, your relative, even your spouse. 
Um, they're very, very charming. They can be very, very controlling. And we get that they want, and then they move along. So um, in truth, uh, so before we go on into what is a psychopath, really we kind of have to talk about what isn't one. Uh, because society is, is kind of led us in a direction that's not really true. Um, there were two uh, psychiatrists, um, a guy named um, Listed and a guy named Lenkowski. And they did, uh, they did a, a long-term study over about uh, three or four years ago. They looked at a hundred different movies. And they, they went down and they actually took a really hardcore look. They, he said they looked at each movie like two or three times and they clinically evaluated each person in that movie that, that was supposed to be a psychopath. Um, so the first person is uh, Anthony Perkins. He played Norman Bates in Psycho. Um, he's actually not really a psychopath. Uh, Norman Bates was based off of a killer by the name of Ed Gein, who was in, uh, I'm probably going to butcher the town, Towns, Township, Wisconsin. Um, now, Ed Gein, when he was eventually caught, he was, he was uh, charged with multiple things, a lot of really weird things like uh, he would dig up graves and make like jewelry or, or mantle stands. Uh, he was uh, charged with uh, cannibalism and necrophilia. He did actually murder a couple of people, but really, um, according to their uh, profiling, uh, Bates is actually more of a psychotic than he is a psychopath. And, and there is actually a clear difference there, but he's, he's not actually the psychopathic profile. Um, the next person they said, very, very scary individual, probably would not want to go to dinner with him, um, is Hannibal Lecter. I mean, Hannibal Lecter, very, very scary, but he's kind of this like larger than life individual. He's, he's the, he's like the total bad guy package. Um, he's eloquent, he's intelligent, he eats people for dinner, he understands that fava beans go with Chianti. I mean, you know, um, a really, a, a really interesting guy, but he's not really as depraved as they should be. Uh, and so when you talk about, you know, who is the real psychopath, we kind of have to like clear idea out that, uh, that it, it, it's the image of these two people. Now in truth, um, who, who really is? Uh, anybody here seen the movie Wall Street? Yeah. So um, if, if you look at it, um, Gordon Gecko uh, is actually, uh, the guy played by Michael Douglas, is actually pretty spot on. Uh, I mean, if you, if you watch him, he is charming, he's alluring, um, but he's also extremely vicious. He doesn't care. He's manipulative. He will push anybody under the bus he needs to. Um, you know, uh, the movie's great because the bad guy loses that on the end. Sorry for anybody I spoil that for. Um, but other than that, he's actually pretty pretty, pretty perfect. He's pretty spot on. Um, the next one, there's a movie called Badlands. Um, and uh, the character Holly, uh, it's about, it's actually about two people who wanted a killing spree and I can't remember where, but um, Holly, um, actually, if you listen to her narration, that's pretty spot on to what psychopaths are actually like. Um, and it, I, I hadn't seen the movie and I actually just like watched part of it to, to, to see it because I was so curious. But if you listen to her through the narration, she has almost this monotone voice. I mean, she talks about going with her boyfriend and they go on a killing spree. And the way that she talks about it in the narration, it's pretty much the same thing. It's like, well, we killed a bunch of people and then we went to go get milk. Um, and, and to them, there's no difference. Um, there's no emotional reaction. Uh, in fact, actually, if you, if you want a quick hit, you don't even want to see the movies. I would just go watch both the trailers uh, because it, gives, it, it pretty much gives their profiles away to the people we're actually dealing with. Um, so, uh, moving on, a quick um, note about traits and definitions. So, um, psychopathy is actually not listed in the Diagnostic and Statistics Manual. Um, it's, it's not, actually. It's a little weird. Um, but um, it's actually, there, there's kind of a sister diagnosis called um, antisocial personality disorder. And it's listed as a personality disorder. Um, but there's, there's a slight, there's a variation between the two of them. So if somebody says that they've been diagnosed with ASPD, that does not necessarily mean that they're a psychopath. Um, and, and vice versa. Um, they can overlap, they can be part of both, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they are. So, um, you know, when looking at diagnosing, there's actually a slight set of uh, a difference in the criteria. Um, in truth, there is a gender bias. Most psychopaths are male, um, to even a frightening, uh, a frightening result. Uh, some psychiatrists feel, although I think that's been disproven at this point, that female psychopaths don't even exist. Um, I, I don't think that's true. I, I've, I've read other people and they said that's, that they, they've, they've actually run into and diagnosed him. But don't worry, um, nature isn't sexist. Um, there are other personality disorders that are as, absolutely as frightening as, as psychopathy um, that, are, that are pretty much close cousins. Um, if you think of the movie Fatal Attraction, that, that would be spot on. Or Misery. Uh, those, those are two pretty excellent examples of it. So, diagnosing a psychopath. Um, 
so like I said uh, earlier, there's a guy named Robert Hare. And uh, throughout the years, he dealt with a lot of, he, he worked in a lot of maximum security prisons. And in truth, he kind of got tired of being caught off guard by them all the time. So he created what they call the Psychopathy Checklist, or the PCL. This is actually what they call the PCLR, Psychopathy Checklist Revised. Uh, so he created it and they changed it along the lines, maybe to make more money or something. Um, but uh, there are two factors, and there are four facets. Uh, it has uh, 20 different, uh, 20 different uh, criteria for it. And each uh, criteria uh, is rated between zero and two. So um, for those of us who are math people, uh, you know, that means that you can get a score between zero and 40. Now, uh, if you look at it, uh, zero through 20 means that you're non-psychopathic at all. In fact, most people actually rate about a four on the scale. So if you look at this and go, oh my god, I'm that person, probably not. Everybody's a little bit psychopathic. Um, uh, <laughs> I really wanted to fit butters into that. I just couldn't. Um, uh, but um, so uh, when you from zero to twenty is is non psychopathic. Um, criminals normally rate higher. Uh, there are instances where they rate somewhere between nineteen and twenty. Um, but when you hit that 20 to 30 scale, they, they call that an indeterminate psychopath or a pseudo-psychopath. There, there are a lot of different names for them. Um, pretty much what it means is that the person evaluating you thinks that you have got some issues, uh, but they can't really say for certain. Uh, some people clearly draw the line at 25, but really 20 to 30 is kind of this independent range. They're indeterminate range. So um, that means that 30 plus, yep, you're one of them. Congratulations, you, you drew the, uh, you, you won the lottery. Uh, and, and that's how, and that's how it's rated. Uh, now I've put, uh, in bold and underlined, uh, the four traits for interpersonal. Now, like I said, like all of them, uh, all of them, most, most psychopaths or all psychopaths are normally alluring or charming. Um, or they're very coercive if they're actually not. But um, they're, they're normally one of those. And if you notice how important this is as far as them being manipulators and charmers, like it's on the checklist. It's not a side item. It's right there. Like this is something that psychologists look for. It's the thing that makes them so dangerous. Um, on the flip side, on facet four is the antisocial. So really, you've kind of got two classifications of psychopaths. We've got the, um, you know, the axe murderers and people, the serial killers, and then you've got the people like Gordon Gecko. And really, um, the key differentiator between them is not that Gordon Gecko is nicer, <laughs> not in the least. It's the fact that Gordon Gecko doesn't necessarily have these antisocial controls or these antisocial behaviors. Um, but they call them successful psychopaths or subcriminal psychopaths because they haven't been arrested yet keyword yet, um, is that they can keep their eyes on the prize. They don't necessarily, like, something doesn't go their own way, something, something doesn't go their way, um, and the successful psychopaths don't end up killing their girlfriend. Um, and I say that lightly, that, that is actually true. Like, the people who hit the higher end the scale, the more violent they become. They're extremely impulsive. They get angry, they solve it. Um, not in the best of ways. So, uh, the real question becomes, ooh, man, uh, the real question becomes, what, what's the difference between them? And I, like I said, they have a biological advantage. Awesome. Um, they, they have a biological advantage to that. And um, so uh, there are, there are a, a few things in the brain, we're going to talk about two of them today, um, that actually makes them different. The first one being the prefrontal cortex. Uh, and uh, there, there are a couple parts, but the, the, we're going to call it prefrontal cortex in general right now. Uh, psychiatrists looked at this and they found psychopaths actually have like smaller gray matter in the prefrontal cortex than non-psychopaths. And what this actually means is the, the prefrontal cortex is known for things like inhibiting inappropriate behavior, um, keeping down impulsiveness, things like that. So really and truthfully, they're predisposed to doing it. It's, it's not upbringing, like they're going to do it. It, it doesn't matter. Uh, and so this is what gives them their impulsive behavior, their idea that, that killing is okay, and a number of things. Um, the other big one, and probably the, the bigger part of it, is uh, the amygdala. Um, the amygdala is about the size of a thumbnail. It's, it's in your brain, obviously. Um, and what this does is the amygdala is actually responsible for the formation and the activation of emotional memory. Uh, and for us, so like, you know, if you have an emotional event like a baby being born or whatever, um, it's recorded in this area of the brain. Now, um, the thing about it is that for psychopaths, this doesn't work. It's, it's, it's there, but it, it doesn't work for them. And uh, this is shown uh, here again. 
uh, did uh, what they call an EEG, an EEG, and they hook a whole bunch of things up to your to your skull, and it measures the electrical impulses in it. And uh, so what he did was, uh, he did this in prison um, in the 60s, so that's probably the reason why he, he at least got away with some of it, um, is that uh, he would hook people up to it, and he would shock them with something that was extremely painful, not life-threatening, it just really, really hurt. And he would count down from 10, and he says, when I reach zero, I am going to give you a shock that really sucks. And for normal people, the closer he would get, they would kind of brace themselves for it. Like they, they would kind of like suck it up and, and you know, the, their brain would fire saying like something is coming. With psychopaths, it doesn't happen. Like he would tell them and they would know that it's coming, but they would still be perfectly relaxed. Their brain never uh, once said, hey, something bad's going to happen. Maybe you should do something about it. Um, along with this, they did a thing called the startle reflex test. And uh, so how many of you, everybody here go to a horror movie at least one time in their life? Yes, good. Okay, so what happens in horror movies? Like their, their, whole, their whole concept is, is to scare you, right? Um, and so the way that they do it is that uh, they, they build up to that moment. They get you on the edge of your seat, and then at that exact moment, they, they bam, and they do the thing, and everybody jumps. And, and the real reason being is that you will react more when you're on edge about something, when you see something that's violent, or you see something that is uh, not necessarily to your liking. Psychopaths, once again, are the opposite, especially when dealing with something that it's absolutely like, horrifyingly and brutal. Going back to that question earlier, if you saw a really horrible scene, what would you do? Um, the most violent ones would actually sit down and they say, well, it fascinates me. And they become so engrossed to it that external stimulus go away. Um, now, what, uh, <clears throat> what this means is that um, psychopaths don't really have, uh, they, deterrents are ineffective for psychopaths. If you tell them, hey, if you break the rules, you're going to go to jail, they may not like jail, but they won't get the emotional response of it which means that things that our entire society are based off of, it doesn't, it doesn't matter for them. They, they don't care. Like the, the threat of me going to jail, I don't want to go to jail. I'm probably no one in this room wants to go to jail. They don't care. Like it sucks for them, but it doesn't, doesn't scare them. Um, and the other thing that's kind of interesting is that um, treatment is, is often has undesired results with them. So um, one of the main things that they try and do in therapy or cognitive behavioral therapy is that they try to get you to, to realize your emotions. Um, they try to get you to think about it. It's like, well, you know, you hurt that person. How do you think that person felt? And they try to get you in touch with that and say like, hey, maybe you should think about doing something differently um, than hurting the person next time because you've hurt them. And you, they try and get you to realize, uh, you know, how you would feel. So there was a thing called the Oak Hill Experiment. Um, and if you go and look at this up, this is actually in Canada in the 60s. And we're going to ignore the fact that they did some really wacky stuff with like being naked and eating food through a straw for 10 days and doing lots of LSD. It's really weird. Um, but what they did do is they tried to get psychopaths to recognize um, their emotions in each other and how they made each other felt. And at the end of it, uh, they said, hey, these people are doing great. Uh, they, they've improved their behavior. Maybe we should let them loose. And so they let a lot of them go. What happened was, is that um, within psychopathic profiles, about 60 people have a recidivism rate, which means, you know, 60% 60, 60 of the people uh, will end up committing a crime after they're released. After the Oak Hill experiment, it went up by 20%. 80% of those people actually had, actually had a recidivism rate. And so um, after they arrested some of them, they, they kind of said, well, you know, what happened with the Oak Hill thing? And one of them finally admitted, they said, you know what, actually, all of that therapy you sent us to, that made us better at being devious. It didn't teach us about ourselves, it taught us about other people and how to deceive them. And, and so it had the exact opposite effect. Um, so with all of this, um, the interesting thing about it is that <clears throat> um, Psychopaths actually uh, look at things very pragmatically, um, and, I'll, and I'll, I'll leave off with this. A guy by the name of Kevin Dutton, Kevin Dutton um, calls this the trolley problem. And so um, the first scenario he presents it with, he says, okay, so you've got a trolley going down the tracks, and at the end, the trolley has gone out of control, and um, at the end of the tracks, there are five people, and they can't get off. The trolley will hit them and kill them. Um, by you is a switch, and you can, switch, you can flip the switch, and you can save the five people. The drawback is, is that when you flip the switch, there's the guy on the other end of the tracks, and that one person will die. What do you do? And so it's, it's a very, um, it, it's uh, normally, when you ask a question like this, um, because we're kind of removed from it, 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 it falls into our prefrontal cortex. Do you, do you save five people at the cost of one, um, or, or vice versa? Uh, and, and they go through it. 
So um, the next step of this problem is where it gets really interesting. So um, same trolley problem, going down the tracks, uh, five people are going to die unless you stop it. There's not a switch this time. However, there's a very large man that's standing next to you. And you can push that man in front of the trolley and it'll derail it, saving the five people. What do you do? To a psychopath, it's a, it's a question about pragmatism. Um, you know, if you take the emotional response out of it, it's the exact same question. It just happens to be the human interaction. The psychopath, nine times out of ten, will most likely say, well, yeah, you push the guy in front of the tracks. You're sacrificing one to save five. Um, and they, I mean, to them, it's not even a question. So um, let's take it a step further. So what if you're a doctor and a patient comes into your office uh, and uh, you have five other patients who are going to die unless they get uh, transplants? And this one patient who happened to come into your office uh, happens to meet uh, the criteria for saving all five other patients. What do you do? Assuming that you won't get caught by killing this individual. Do you let him go or do you quietly hide the body and save your other five patients? So um, the real question about this is uh, what do we do and where do we go? Um, the unfortunate part about it is that uh, because it's due to genetics, like, they're, they're always going to be around. Uh, psychopaths, like, we'll, we'll never get rid of them. Even, um, you know, oh, <laughs> I jumped. Uh, they, they really do. They, they, they'll be around. They'll always be predators for the rest of us. They'll, they'll hunt out the weak people of the herd. And um, what's really sad is that even if society changes, they won't. They'll always be here. And, and they, like I said, they've shown that. Uh, you know, they'll, even if, even if we change how we parent, it, they'll, they'll still be, they'll still pop up. So um, the unfortunate part about them is that really all we can do is just learn that they exist and we learn to cope with them and adapt. Um, and unfortunately, like, they're, they're so good at it. They are the wolves in sheep's clothing. And, and when, you know, when we eventually find out, it's normally too late. But they'll always be there. Questions? Oh, question. Oh, oh, sorry. Yeah, um, sorry. So I guess I'm out of time. But uh, if you have questions, I'll be in the hall or around. Um, so thanks. Oops.